Oh, hey, a few years ago, we did a three part cabinet building series and I walked you through exactly how I like to build cabinets. And you guys really enjoyed it because it's one of the most viewed video series we've ever put out. The one complaint we got was it was hard to find part one, part two, and part three because they get lost on the interweb and it's just, you wanna watch them all together. So we heard you and we're gonna take all three of those videos and we're gonna put them together into this video, which is just the entire thing. Part one, part two, part three, all in one place, easy to watch. We also created plans for the simple cabinet box that we make that you can use as a reference. They're available on our website. There's a link down below and they're cheap. $10 for the set of plans. It'll walk you through exactly how we build cabinets. And another thing that people commented in the comment section on this video in particular is how do we attach the toe kick to the cabinet box? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, we don't. They're just separate. And if that doesn't make any sense, well, just watch the video. It all makes sense once you watch the, the thing. So enjoy and learn how to make some cabinets. All right, let's jump right in here. Now cabinets are nice because you don't need a lot of materials. For this cabinet, we're simply using one sheet of three quarter inch plywood, a few sticks of three quarter inch poplar for face frames, and one sheet of quarter inch plywood for our back panel. In my opinion, the easiest way to go about building cabinets is to first pre-cut all of your pieces. Then with all of your pieces pre-cut, all you have to do is, well, hook them together. Now, as we go through this video, there might be some steps that may be a little confusing. You might say, what the heck's he doing that for? I don't understand. But I promise if you just watch the full video, it will all come together and make perfect sense in the end. So we're gonna start by first cutting out the three main pieces of our cabinet box. This includes both side pieces as well as our bottom piece, all cut from three quarter inch birch ply. Next, on the bottom of both of our side pieces, we are going to cut a three quarter inch dadoed groove. This will allow us to attach our side pieces to our bottom piece without having to use any exterior nails or screws that will be visible from the outside of your cabinet. So after setting your blade to half inch to leave a quarter inch material on the plywood, I like to put a sacrificial fence in place. A sacrificial fence is simply a piece of wood that allows us to push the fence all the way up against the blade without scarring up our permanent fence, hence the word sacrificial. Now I'm doing this because as you see, I'm not using a dado stack. Why you ask? Well, it's because I'm lazy. And I also wanted to show you that you can do this without a dado stack if you don't have one. You just have to make multiple passes to remove the desired three quarter inches of material. But in order to get the most accurate cut, it's best to start in at our desired depth and then work our way out towards the end of the board until the blade is flush against that sacrificial fence to make our last cut. As you can see, I've dadoed out a nice 3 quarter inch groove at the bottom of both of my side pieces. This will allow me to hook those side pieces into the bottom piece, just like this. Then with both of our side pieces dadoed, I'm going to remove the sacrificial fence and set my fence to four inches. Then I'm just gonna run some scrap pieces of plywood through and get a couple strips of four inch wide material. You'll see why in just a second. Then I'm gonna set my blade to a quarter inch high. Next, we have to dado out a quarter inch groove on the back of our two side pieces as well as the back of our bottom piece. This groove will catch the back panel of our cabinet box. Like I said, this will all make sense here in just a few minutes. Again, I am not using a dado stack, so you'll need to run the board through twice to get your desired quarter inch thick dado. And it's also very important to note that that dado needs to sit in three quarters of an inch from the back of your panels. You'll see why in just a second. Just hold on, be patient, jeez. I like to keep a piece of scrap quarter inch ply handy just to make sure that it'll fit nicely in my dadoed out groove. When you're done cutting all the dados on your side and bottom piece, turn your saw off and just leave it alone. Don't change the settings, we're gonna need that dado setting here in just a minute. 
but in the meantime we can hook together the first three pieces of our cabinet box. As you can see that dadoed out groove perfectly lines up from each side piece to the bottom and this will create the perfect channel for us to slide in the back panel of our cabinet. To make gluing up our cabinet box easier, I like to raise my bottom panel up off my work surface. This just allows me to get clamps underneath it and, you know, not fiddle around on a flat surface. Here's some helpful advice. If you're going to do cabinet boxes with any regularity, go out and invest in some of these woodpecker clampy thingamajigs. They make clamping up cabinet boxes by yourself incredibly easy, as well as allowing you to ensure that everything is nice and square. As you can see, your side panels should perfectly fit into your bottom panel with that 3 quarter inch dado we cut previously. Then all you need to do is simply apply a liberal amount of glue onto the inside of that cut dado and use a glue brush. As you can see, I'm using my patented Bourbon Moth glue brush to smear the glue around and then just hook it in place. As well as the woodpeckers clampy thingies worked for alignment, I don't really trust them for sheer clamping force. So when everything is aligned exactly how I want it, I like to throw on a few additional clamps as it glues up. And just like that, we have the first three pieces of our cabinet box hooked together. Now we just have to wait for the glue to dry and then we can start working on the upper pieces. But in the meantime, we can get all of our additional pieces cut to size and ready to rock once that glue's dry. Remember those random four inch strips I had you cut down earlier? Yeah, now's where you're gonna use them. So you're gonna wanna cut down four pieces of four inch scrap plywood. Now they need to be the exact length of the inside of your cabinet box. And then one of those four pieces is gonna need another quarter inch dadoed groove. Good thing you left your saw alone because now you can just run it through. Then using a Craig jig, we are going to drill pocket holes into the end of each one of these four pieces. This will allow us to hook these brace pieces inside the cabinet and not use any screws coming in from the outside that you'll have to, you know, look at or fill or something like that. Then with all of our brace pieces cut, we just have to cut the back panel of our cabinet box. Now the cabinet I'm building is actually going to be completely full of drawers and so essentially you wouldn't really need a back panel but I wanted to show you how to do this because if you're building a cabinet with cabinet doors you're going to want that panel in there so you don't just see a ugly wall behind the cabinet. Then the final thing we need to do before actually constructing our cabinet box completely is to build a kick plate for the box to sit on. Now some people integrate the kick plate into the actual cabinet box itself. I'm not a huge fan of this. I like to do a separate kick plate. That way I can install my kick plate, get them shimmed and level, and then all I have to do is drop my cabinet box on top, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now most kick plates are between three and a half to four inches. I like to go three and a half, no need to go up to four, <laughs> that's just crazy. So I cut down all my pieces for my kick plate and then I drill them out again with pocket holes and we'll use those to assemble it so you won't see any of those pesky screws. All kick plates are a little different depending on the orientation of your cabinet. This is how ours is going to look. You'll notice that one of the corners is mitered. That's because you'll actually see the kick plate on both sides. So we want to miter that corner so we don't have any exposed plywood either on the front or the side of the cabinet. This is how I like to do mitered corners on my kick plates. It might not be the right way or the only way, but this is my way. I first take a piece of blue painter's tape and I tape both pieces together with each end of my miter perfectly touching. 
Then I apply a dab of wood glue into the center of that miter, leaving a little room on each edge. Then I use a few dabs of CA glue on either side and the accelerator spray. The CA glue is going to dry instantly and hold the miter together while my wood glue dries. Essentially the CA glue is acting like a clamp in this case. It's way easier than trying to get some clamps on and funky angles and hold pressure on that miter till the wood glue dries. It also speeds up productivity because I can take the tape off immediately and continue constructing my kick plate. Finally I just hit the corner with a little 220 sandpaper, you know, to make it look pretty. And then I construct the rest of my kick plate, again using those pre-drilled pocket holes that we did, you know, a little while ago in this video. Then with our kick plate done, call me old fashioned, but I like to start working off the floor. I mean, that's where my cabinet's gonna sit in the end, so might as well get down there as soon as possible. So I set our three-sided cabinet box on top of the kick plate, and then I can start assembling all of my internal brace pieces as well as my back panel. Now you might have guessed this was coming, but our one brace piece that we cut the quarter inch groove sits on top of our back panel and locks it in place. Then I like to use just one clamp to hold my brace in place while I secure it with four pocket screws. Then I repeat the exact same step, this time on the front of the cabinet with the front brace piece. And you guessed it, I do it two more times, both on the bottom and top of the back of our cabinet. These are what is known as our lower and upper nailer pieces. These are the pieces that will actually screw through to secure the cabinet to the wall. And as you can see, because we inset our back panel three quarters of an inch from the back of our cabinet, those pieces sit in there very nicely. Now, the cool thing about cabinet construction is you can use it in a lot of different ways. This top nailer piece could be cut with a 45 angle on the bottom to become a French cleat. That way, you could actually hang the cabinet off the wall if you were doing, you know, like an upper cabinet or something. Then finally, I like to take a few inch and a half cabinet head screws and just secure my top brace into my back brace. This just sures everything up and makes sure it is not going anywhere. You could probably get away without doing this, but when it comes to actually securing the cabinet to the wall, this will keep that back piece from bowing out at all. And then I flip it over and do the exact same thing to the bottom as well. And with that, our box is constructed, and now it's time to face frame. To construct our face frame, I'll be using 3 quarter inch poplar. This is a paint grade piece and poplar paints amazingly. Now if it was going to go in a kitchen or bathroom, someplace high traffic, I might do something a little harder like hard maple, but this is for an office so poplar it is. When constructing my face frame, I like to start by just laying out the entire thing on the cabinet box itself. That way I know it's going to be perfect. I always like to do full runs on the side of my cabinet so there's not any visible end grain. So after cutting them down to size, next I like to clamp them in place to get them exactly where I want them, usually leaving about a 32nd of an inch overhang on my plywood so that I can sand it back smooth. With my two side pieces in place, I then fit my internal pieces, making sure they fit very nice and snug. Not so tight that they push my outer pieces out, but also not too loose so that they bring my outer pieces in. See how that works? I think it's physics or something. Then I mark all of my pieces just so I can keep track of exactly where they go. Then I take them off the cabinet box and move over to the bench top and hooking them together from the back side, I use again pocket holes. 
I used to hook all my face frames together with dowels or dominoes, but it's just a pain in the butt to try and get everything assembled, especially with internal face structures. And for cabinet grade, pocket holes are actually designed for this very purpose, so don't feel bad using them. I assemble each joint with just a dab of glue and then I like to clamp it directly down to my tabletop using one of these little grizzly hold down clamps. This just makes sure it doesn't slide up or down as I screw it together. And after I do one corner, I just work my way around until I have done all four corners and completed my frame. Then with the exterior of my face frame done, I can start working on the interior components. Now this particular cabinet is going in an office. It's gonna have four drawers in total, two larger drawers on the bottom with two smaller drawers on top. So I start by first putting in my center piece. Once I have that hooked in place, I can cut my smaller pieces that will be my drawer dividers. Again, you wanna make sure these are nice and snug. I tried to do a sexy dust blowing thing, but I got sawdust in my eye. What an idiot. Then to position your drawer dividers properly, the best way I've found is to cut some spacer blocks. You can just set them on the bottom of your face frame and then you just set your drawer divides in place and this will ensure that all of your drawers are identical and nice and square. Then you just hook them in place with those handy dandy pocket holes and just like that, your face frame is complete. See? Look, I've been framed. <laughs> I've been framed. <laughs> Anyways, with our face frame complete, it is time to attach it to our cabinet box. Now, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and there's more than one way to attach a face frame, and it kind of depends on what kind of cabinet you're building. If you were doing a wood grade stained cabinet, then you could use pocket holes on the outside of the cabinet if it's butting up against another cabinet so you won't see the side, or you could tack it on from the top, that might work, and you could fill the holes. If it's going to be all drawers like this one, you could use pocket holes from the inside because you won't actually see the inside of the cabinet. But since this is paint grade, I decided I was just going to BAM, 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 nail it on and fill all my holes. Because that's the easiest way to do it, and for paint grade, you can get away with it. So the first thing I do is lay down a nice thick bead of glue around the entire perimeter of my cabinet box and then using my patented glue spreader I spread it out and just plop the face frame on there and then once it's right where I want it I just tack it down with about you know four to five nails per side until it is held securely in place. When it comes to filling nail holes, there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. This is what I like to use. It's this DAP plastic wood. They make two kinds of this product, a water-based as well as an alcohol-based. Definitely spring for the alcohol-based. It works much better and dries much quicker. Now when you fill the hole, you don't want to just push it all down there so that the wood filler is flush with the top of the face frame. You want to fill the hole and then kind of mound the filler up on top. That way, as it dries and shrinks, which it will do, it will shrink into that pile so that when you sand it, it will be flush and you won't have shrunken little nail holes all the way around your face frame. Next is the bane of every cabinet maker's existence, is trying to get no line where your face frame meets your plywood. Now, the best method I have found for achieving this is this product by Mohawk. It's a two-part epoxy filler, the white part on the inside and the black part on the outside. It also comes in multiple colors. I prefer the black so I can see when I've sanded it away. You just mash it together and smear it in the crack. It dries crazy hard and it doesn't shrink, which is really nice, and it'll give you a perfect seam. Then with that all filled, you just have to sand your face frame thoroughly, getting rid of any ridges or edges. Now, stop everything for a second. I've heard a lot of people say when they're sanding the transition between face frame and plywood that they're very worried about burning through the plywood veneer. Now, I understand this if you're doing a finish grade piece with a veneered hardwood plywood, but when it comes to paint grade, don't worry about sanding through the veneer. 
you want a smooth transition. That should be your number one goal. And if you have to sand through the veneer, like you're gonna see me do here in just a second, to achieve that, it's worth doing. It'll paint beautifully, and you'll never be able to tell that you went through the veneer once it's all painted. As you can see, I couldn't give two cares that I'm burning through the veneer. All I care about is that you're not gonna be able to see the seam between the face frame and the plywood. And then the very last thing I like to do is just take a piece of sandpaper and by hand break down all the internal edges of my face frame so there's no splinters or chip outs and they are nice to the touch. Well, hoota lolly, hoota lolly, our cabinet is done and ready for drawers and eventually drawer faces. Well, that Jason guy really knows his stuff. Hopefully you're enjoying this video and you're learning something. Hey, did you know that we have plans available for this build on our website that we created with Squarespace? The nice thing with Squarespace is that it's super easy to sell digital downloadable plans right on your website. Cause you just get on there, you place the order and then they're emailed directly to your inbox. The other thing we love about Squarespace is they make it so simple to design a website even if you don't know what the heck you're doing, which is basically me in a nutshell. You just get on there, you pick your template, you customize it however you want, and boom, you have a professional looking website and it's not even that hard. You can also create your own web domain right there on the website. So if you want www.ilovetomakethingsoutofpallets.com, well, you can do that on Squarespace, although I don't recommend it because pallet furniture is gross. But let's just say that you do want to start a pallet furniture business. Well, Squarespace makes it really easy to grow that business with helpful tools like email campaigns. Let's say you want to let everybody know on your email list that you got some new pallet furniture coming out. Well, it's just clicking a few buttons and everybody gets an email. Hey, I got ugly pallet furniture for sale. Let's say you want to sell your ugly pallet furniture on your website and in person, and you don't want to deal with the hassle of balancing your inventory online and in person. Well, with Squarespace, they make it incredibly easy to hook up a square card reader to your website and it automatically updates the inventory online when you sell something in person. If you want to check out Squarespace for yourself, just go to squarespace.com slash bourbonmoth woodworking and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain when you use the coupon code bourbonmoth woodworking. So go check it out, either the link down below or you can just follow this prompt right there. Squarespace, making it easy to sell ugly stuff, but we recommend selling pretty stuff from like real wood, pallets are gross. The first thing you're going to want to do is get a pair of side mount drawer slides and well, chuck them on the floor. Shoot, you might as well even just stomp on them. Heck, just go ahead and throw them across your shop. You are never going to want to use those again. Let me introduce you to something just a little bit better, the undermount drawer slide. Now, a lot of people are intimidated by undermount drawer slides because there's multiple pieces, like these little orange things. I mean, what the heck do they even do? But don't worry, I'm going to show you how to install them quick and easy, and you will see why this is the best drawer slide you could use. I'm also going to show you how to install drawer slides and drawers for two different applications. On the right side of the cabinet, I'll show you how to install drawer slides for inset drawer faces. And on the left side, I'll show you how to install for overmount drawer faces. Overmount, left, inset, right. Got it? Good. Let's start with the overmount drawers first. You're going to start by taking a tape measure and measuring the distance from the bottom of the inside of your cabinet to the bottom of that top brace piece. Next, we're going to take some scrap pieces of ply and just rip them down on the table saw. The exact width doesn't really matter, but I cut these to three and a half inches, just in case you're wondering. You also need two of them. Then taking our two scrap pieces, we're going to mark one for the left side of our box and one for the right side. Then we're going to measure three eighths of an inch over from the right edge of our right piece. And we're going to transfer a straight line from top to bottom. Again, this line needs to be exactly 3 8 of an inch from that outer edge. Then you're going to take your pieces and insert them into the cabinet and pull them all the way to the front until they are flat against your face frame, putting the left piece on the left side and the right piece 
you guessed it, on the right side, making sure that that line is exactly in line with the edge of our face frame on the right side. Then just taking a pencil, we're going to trace out the corner of each opening where our drawers will be inserted. It's also important to note that that left piece is pushed all the way over as far as it'll go until it is up against the side wall of our cabinet box. When you purchase the undermount drawer slides, they come with two slides as well as these little metal brackets. Now these brackets are super handy because they hook right on the back of the slide so that you can mount the slide inside the cabinet. We'll be mounting these little brackets to our pre-cut plywood pieces. Before we do so, we do need to draw a little mark 3 8 of an inch over from the lines we drew on our left piece. Because these brackets do need to sit over on each side 3 8 of an inch to line up perfectly with the front of our cabinet. But now that we have everything marked appropriately, all we need to do is simply put all of our brackets in the right spot. Our right piece is easy because we drew that 3 8 of an inch line, we can push those right brackets all the way up to the outside edge. Then we just screw them down. Now you can mount these directly to the back of the cabinet, but the point of these plywood pieces is that you can do all your mounting outside of the cabinet without having to fumble around too much inside the cabinet. Although that looks very funny and your friends might find it enjoyable, it's kind of a pain in the butt. You can see because we put those back nailer strips on when we constructed the cabinet, it creates the perfect place for us to sink some screws in and hold our scrap pieces nice and securely. Our left piece can get pushed into that far back corner and you'll know it's exactly where it needs to be. However, you will need to measure over from the outer cabinet wall to make sure that that right piece is landed in the correct spot. Should look just like this. Then with our brackets easily and securely on the back of our cabinet, installing the drawer slides is, well, it's just as easy as this. You just literally hook them into those back brackets and because these are for overmount drawer faces, they just rest perfectly on our front face frame. Then all you need to do is take one small cabinet screw per slide and hold them securely in place to our face frame. I like to set them back about an eighth of an inch to make sure our drawer faces sit nice and flush on the face of our cabinet. And that's all you have to do for overmount drawer face, drawer slide installation. Wow, that was a mouthful. Now let's do our inset drawers. For this you'll need four pieces. That's right, four. You're going to take two of those pieces and you're going to drill pocket holes into both ends. Again, only two of the four pieces you cut and these should be the exact same size as the brace pieces you cut for the overmount. Then taking the other two pieces that you did not put pocket holes in, you are going to prepare them in exactly the same way as you did the other side, just as if you were doing overmount drawer slides, hooking the brackets on and securing them to the back of the cabinet. However, the difference between the inset drawer installation and the overmount installation is that our drawer slides cannot rest on the face frame at the front of our cabinet. Hence the phrase inset, meaning they need to be inset inside our face frame. So we need to create a separate surface to attach our drawer slides to. This is where I take those two additional brace pieces with the pre-drilled pocket holes and I just attach them vertically from the bottom to the top of our cabinet. And well, like I said, I just, I hook them in place with some pocket holes. It's not that fancy but it does give us a nice flat surface for us to attach our drawer slides to. As you can see, this is where the drawer slide would be for an overmount, but we want it set back enough for our drawer face to sit internally inside that face frame. Again, we just hold each drawer slide in place with one small cabinet screw. They're very easy to line up with the front of your cabinet. You just want them perfectly in line with that front lip of your face frame. And voila, all of our drawer slides are installed. Overmount on the left, inset on the right, and now we have come to the portion where it is time to build our drawer boxes.
Before we can start building our box, we first have to determine the correct depth and width that we would like our box to be. Now our depth will always be determined by the size of our drawer slides. For this project, I'm using 21 inch drawer slides, so the depth of our box is 21 inches. The width, however, will be the distance between slides, as you can see me measuring here, plus the thickness of our two side pieces. We also have to determine the height we want each drawer to be. A good rule of thumb when dealing with undermount drawer slides is one inch smaller than the opening of your face frame. Now you can make them smaller than that, you just don't want to make them any bigger. Because this is a how-to video, I decided to show you, in my opinion, the easiest drawers you could possibly make. Now most of the time when I'm building drawers for cabinets, built-ins, desks, etc., I build them out of Baltic birch ply. This is a great material to build drawers out of because it's stable, so you don't have to worry about any seasonal movement, and it cleans up very nice and makes a very attractive drawer. So after cutting down a bunch of pieces to the proper width for our top and bottom drawers, we need to add a little dadoed groove onto each of our side rail pieces. This groove will catch the bottom panel of each one of our drawers. Now that panel has to sit a half inch up from the bottom of the drawer side in order to allow clearance for our undermount drawer slides. So I use a spacer block to determine my distance from my fence and then I like to set my dados at a quarter of an inch which will allow the panel to sit nice and snug within the box itself. You'll notice that I'm not using a quarter of an inch dado stack, so you'll have to run each piece through twice to get a quarter of an inch dado for your bottom panel. I actually prefer doing it this way because I can micro adjust my second pass and make sure that my panel sits nice and tight within my drawer. Then with all of our pieces cut to the proper width and with our dado groove in place, we can start cutting all of our drawer box pieces. I like to start by first cutting my outer sides. Now we know those are going to be the exact length of our drawer slides. Again, I'm using 21 inch drawer slides. So we have four drawers in total. That means I need eight pieces cut at 21 inches. Then I adjust the stop on my fence to that internal measurement that we got off of the distance between our two drawer slides. For this it's just over 13 and a half inches. So I cut eight pieces at 13 and a half inches. This should create a box that looks something like this. Next you need to pick one of those internal pieces to be the back of your drawer. Now to accommodate our undermount drawer slides, we need to add a little notch on either side of those internal pieces. This will allow the drawer slide to sit flush against the bottom of the drawer. So I just mark over an inch and a half and one half inch up, and I just cut out a little notch on either side using the bandsaw. You could also do this using a jigsaw or a handsaw. Really anything will work. They don't have to be pretty because they will be at the back of our drawer and you'll never see them. At this point you should have four pieces, two side pieces, the length of your drawer slide, and two internal pieces, one with those notches cut out. And then we just need to cut our bottom panel, making sure that it is big enough to sit inside that quarter of an inch dadoed groove we added to all of our pieces. For my bottom panel, I'm simply using some quarter inch Baltic birch to match my Baltic birch sides. Then before we piece them all together, I like to pre-sand all my pieces. There is nothing worse than trying to sand the inside of a drawer after it's all put together. Then with all of our pieces cut and pre-sanded, it is time to start hooking them together. And this is how easy it is to do just that. I just add a little bit of glue to each side and tack it in place with a 16 gauge brad nailer. This method is by far the quickest, most efficient way to hook drawers together and actually makes an incredibly strong drawer. The orientation of the drawer here is key. The direction of the brad nails means that every time you pull that drawer open, you are pulling the opposite direction that the nails are actually put in, meaning you can never pull that drawer apart and it really will last a lifetime. 
You will, however, have some exposed holes from your nails on the side of your drawer. Now, if you don't like this, I typically fill my holes, and with the Baltic birch, they blend in quite nicely. Another way to accomplish this exact same drawer is to skip the brad nails entirely and do pocket holes on each of your internal pieces. These pocket holes will be covered up by your drawer face and hidden on the back of your drawer and will give you a perfectly clean drawer side. However, doing it this way does increase the amount of time you have to spend on each drawer and when you're doing a large run for a large piece, I just don't feel the extra time really increases the look of the piece by that much. And I've yet to have a customer complain about the few small filled brad holes on the edge of a drawer. If you're not building drawers for cabinets or built-ins, maybe a fancy piece of custom furniture and you want a nicer look yet, I do have a video on how to do your own box joints. You can check that out by clicking the little tab in the upper corner right now. With all of our drawers glued and nailed together, I go over the entire box just with a little palm sander to knock down any of the places I missed with my pre-sanding. I also like to hit each edge with a small block plane to add a light chamfer just to soften the edge and de-splinter it. Then, as I mentioned, I like to go back and fill all of my nail holes just to hide them a little bit more and they'll be directly behind the drawer face so after sanded and finished they'll be practically invisible. Just like I was in middle school. Then whenever I'm doing a custom run of drawers for a client, I find that the drawer side is the perfect place to add my brand. Just don't be one of those goofs that doesn't take the two seconds to sand your brand afterwards. I hate that yellow border and so many people seem to just go with it. Ugly! And wouldn't you know it, our drawers are done and ready to install. Here's where those foreign little orange clicky things come into play. Now these are actually the locks that hook the drawer slide into the bottom of the drawer. They'll come included with your set of undermount drawer slides. You simply hook them in place with a few small screws and when you pinch these side to side they'll unlock your drawer from your piece allowing you to remove it. They also have these handy dandy rollers on the top of each piece that allow you to adjust the drawer from left to right after it's installed. You can also move it up and down with this little clippy thing. In addition to the orange clips locking the drawer in from the front, there are these tabs that lock the drawer in from the back. Now they make a bunch of different jigs that you can use to determine where to drill the holes for those tabs to sit in properly, but the easiest thing to do is just to insert your drawer into your slides and bang it a few times. It sounds silly, but your tabs will leave tiny marks and let you know exactly where you need to drill out your holes for those tabs to be accepted. Then all you have to do is take a drill with a quarter inch drill bit and drill a quarter inch by half inch hole right where those tabs left their marks. And here's where it gets crazy. This is how easy it is to install drawers at this point. You simply set them in place and push. Those tabs lock into those pre-drilled holes on the back and those orange clippy things lock into the front of the drawer slide. Well, on the front and the drawer can be adjusted side to side with those little rollers. Installing is just like this. You push the drawer in until it clicks in place and your drawer is installed. They make another type of undermount drawer slide where it doesn't have the auto adjust rollers to move the drawer side to side. They're a little cheaper and I tend to use these for overmount drawer faces where I don't need that side to side adjustment. It only takes a few minutes to get our other three drawers ready for installation by adding our clips and drilling our holes. And then to show you exactly how easy it is to install drawers at this point, I'm going to install all four of these drawers in real time. One. Two. Three. Four. Now, wasn't that easy? On top of being incredibly easy to install, undermount drawers will give you the smoothest glide out of any drawer slide on the market. 
No, I'm not being paid to say that, I just really like them. I'll include a link to all of the drawer slide components in the video description below. As you can see here installed, we have the drawers on the left for our overmount drawer faces and the drawers on the right for our inset drawer faces. Then finally, I like to remove my drawers and finish them all with a nice coat of linseed oil or in this case I'm using Rubio Monocoat, which is just linseed oil. I like using linseed oil because I can usually get away with one coat of finish and it leaves my drawer box smelling wonderful. Not all chemically like lacquer or polyurethane. You uh, want to make some drawer faces, do ya? Well, it's a good thing you're watching this video because that's what it's about, silly. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get all your measurements to figure out exactly what size drawer faces you need to make. As I mentioned in the last couple of videos, I set up the left side of this cabinet to have overmount drawer faces, and the right side I set up to have inset drawer faces. So I'm going to show you how to do both types. The style drawer faces we'll be learning today is a standard shaker style drawer face. Now shaker style is by far the most popular style for drawer faces and cabinet doors on the market today. I couldn't show you how to do every style, so naturally I just went with the most popular. Hope it helps. This is basically what the drawer face will look like. You have two styles, or you know these two long pieces on the side, and two rails. So those are the two pieces on the inside. And each rail gets a small tenon that extends into the style and holds everything together. If you ever have trouble remembering which ones are the rails and which ones are the styles, this is how I like to remember. You got your styles on the outside like Ryan Styles, who I assume is a pretty stand-up guy. So they're standing up on the outside. And then you got your rails. Now, they're like rails on a train track. Trains can't drive straight up, so they can't be those ones on the outside. They gotta be those ones going nice and level on the inside. Rails, Styles. There you go. Phew! Glad we got that behind us. Now that we know the general layout of our drawer faces, we have to cut up a bunch of stock that we can mill down to, well, construct our drawer face, obviously. So first I just run everything through the joiner to get a nice straight edge before I take it over to the table saw. Now when it comes to the width of your rails and styles, you can really do them any width you want. I'm sure there's a standardized size out there that's traditional, but I don't know it, so don't ask me. But for these specific drawer faces, I'm cutting all my pieces down to two and a quarter inch. I should also note that these drawer faces are being made out of three quarter inch stock. That's pretty standard when it comes to most cabinet drawer faces as well as doors. Now at this point, I've only rough cut my pieces to the correct size. So after I run through the joiner and the table saw, get them nice and square, I go over to the chop saw and I cut all my pieces to the exact lengths that I need. Making sure that I keep track of which pieces are my rails and which pieces are my styles. In fact, to do so, I like to mark all of my pieces with an S or an R. Those are S's and R's, just in case you can't read my handwriting. At this point, I could tell you to walk over to the router table and finish off your rail and style pieces in what some might call the easy way, cutting all your corresponding mortise and tenons and grooves on some fancy bits. But that's not the way I learned how to do it. I learned how to do it the old-fashioned way, the way they did it back in the 1700s, on an industrial table saw. So that's the process I'm going to show you. So, with all of our rail and style pieces cut to the correct length, we are going to insert a dado stack into the table saw to cut a quarter of an inch groove down the center of all of our pieces. This quarter of an inch groove will catch our internal panel, but it will also act as the mortise to catch the tenons that will be cutting into our rail pieces. So it's important to note, whatever height you set your dado blade to, is going to determine the length of your corresponding tenon. For my drawer faces, I typically do a three quarter inch tenon, which means you need a three quarter inch deep groove cut down the center of each piece. You also wanna keep track of how you're running each piece through the table saw. You'll notice I'm keeping that S or R mark facing outward. 
This just makes sure that if I didn't get my dado dead in the center of my piece, by keeping that mark on the outside as I assemble the whole drawer face, it just ensures that, well, everything is going to come together nicely in the end. At this point, you should have a quarter of an inch by three quarter inch deep dado cut down the center of all of your rail and style pieces. Now we can start cutting the tenons on our rail pieces. For this, I like to use a crosscut sled on the table saw. You're going to want to insert a one inch dado stack and then you're going to raise the blade so that it just meets that quarter inch dado that you already cut in your pieces. I like to start a little shallow and then slowly work my way up to the correct height. That way I know I don't cut too far too soon. I also like to mark the length of my tenon. In this case it's going to be three quarters of an inch. So I take a three quarter inch setup block and I mark out exactly where I want to cut my tenon to. I also cut this shallow at first and then slowly creep up to the correct depth. That way I make sure I don't overcut with my first initial pass. Sometimes it's even helpful to just have a extra piece that you can use as a test block to get everything set up perfectly. As you can see with this pass, I was still a little shallow. There's just a little bit left over before I meet that dado. So I need to raise my saw blade up just a little bit. And I'll keep doing this going back and forth until the height is dead on. Now, just like running them through to get that quarter inch groove, you wanna cut all of your tenons on one side first. And then you can test everything, make sure it's the right length. And then once you have one side cut, then you can switch to the other side. This just keeps everything nice and even and ensures that we don't overcut anything. But once you get your saw dialed in exactly where you want it, you simply run all your pieces through. When it comes to cutting your other side, it's important that you set up your piece like this with the uncut little tab against the stop first. If you set it up this way and then cut the other side first, once you cut that other side and flip it around, you're gonna lose your registration mark and your cuts are gonna be off. So just make sure you think about that when you're making your second pass and final cut on your tenon. Then after ensuring that your saw is set correctly, you simply run every piece through again, cutting those nice tenons that will perfectly interlock into the mortises on our style pieces. It should look something, well, like this. You should have two rail pieces with those perfectly cut tenons that are a quarter of an inch by three quarter inch long. And you should have a style piece on each side with a perfect quarter inch by three quarter inch deep dado. As you can see, our tenons fit nice and snug into our style pieces. You want them to fit snug, but not so snug that you really have to force them and possibly break the thinner edge on your style. You also have to remember that you will be gluing these together, so if they're too tight, once you put that glue in, you are going to expand that dimension a little bit, and it's going to be much harder to get them together if they're too tight. So, loose is okay, just not so loose that it's like floppy. Nobody wants floppy. But with all of our rails and styles cut correctly and test fitted, we can now cut our panels to set inside each drawer face. Now, if you were making cabinet doors, you would make them exactly the same way. The only difference would be that you'd insert a quarter inch panel into the center of each piece, and that would create a nice shaker style cabinet door. Because we're doing drawers, I like to use a half inch panel inside each piece. Now you're probably thinking, wait a second, half inch panel? You cut a quarter inch dado, you dimwit? Well, don't worry, I've got a solution. Just follow along and I'll show you exactly why I like to use a half inch panel versus a quarter inch panel. What the heck, I'll just tell you right now. If you use a quarter inch panel in your drawer face, then it's gonna sit internally inside your frame, which means when you push it up against your flat drawer box, you're gonna have a void behind it where the panel is recessed into the cabinet. By using a half inch panel, we can actually make it flush on the back and recessed on the front. Simply by removing a little bit of material at the bottom of the half inch panel, 
to create a quarter inch groove that can slide perfectly into our dadoed rails and styles, thus making it look exactly like a shaker style door on the front with a perfectly flush panel on the back side. To accomplish this, we're gonna reinsert a dado stack. I like to use just a big old fatty one. This is a one inch dado stack. I then apply a sacrificial fence to the fence on my table saw so that I can push the fence all the way over against that dado stack and actually allow the dado to cut into it partially. This way I can hone in the exact distance that I want my dado to cut. Next, I like to take a scrap piece of my panel material. For these doors, we're using MDF because they're paint grade and MDF paints great. Paint grade, paint great. Ha, <laughs> that's kind of funny. As you can see with my test cut, it's not quite long enough and just a little bit loose inside my dado. So I need to lower my saw blade just a little bit and adjust my fence over to create a longer tenon. So I keep going back and forth doing this, running my scrap piece through until I have it fitting absolutely perfect, nice and snug within my dado groove. It should look, well, just like this. As you can see, the panel is recessed on the front and perfectly flush on the back, which will allow us to seat our drawer faces nice and flat against our drawer boxes. Next, you take your actual pre-cut panels and run them through on all four sides. That's right, because you know the drawer face has four sides, so it kind of makes sense that, well, this would have four sides too. And it should look exactly like this. You can see a nice rabbited out groove on the perimeter of our entire piece that will allow us to fit it perfectly inside our pre-cut rails and styles. Then with all of our panels cut, I like to do a test fit on all of my pieces before I glue them up. The last thing you want is to start to glue them up immediately and realize that something is a little off somewhere and then have to try and make adjustment cuts with everything covered in glue. But because I'm such a fine woodworker, it actually fits. Wow. Once you are happy with the fit of your drawer face pieces, then, well, you just need to glue them all together. Now, I like to liberally glue my tenons into my style pieces and then add just a few small drops of glue to my actual panel piece just to keep it from moving around inside the frame. Now, I can get away with this because my panels are MDF, so they're stable and are not going to move. If you're using a solid wood panel on the inside, you're probably gonna to wanna to do more of a traditional floating panel and forego the glue on the actual panel piece. But with all of our pieces glued, we just add a few little clamps. Now, honestly, if your pieces are cut snug enough, you probably don't even need the clamps. You could just glue them together and let them sit. But I like to throw some clamps on just to be safe. And because this is a video and we have the benefit of movie magic, look at that. My drawer faces are already dry. So I take them out of clamps and then you wanna sand all of your pieces. Now you can do this just with a palm sander, which I was gonna do and then I remembered, oh yeah, I got this drum sander over here just collecting dust. So I sent all of them through the drum sander and then took them over to the belt sander just to hit all the edges and sand down those tenons very nicely. I should note, however, that you don't want to use the belt sander to try and sand your belt while you're wearing it. I tried that once and it did not end well. But after I use the belt sander, I just go over the entire drawer face again with the palm sander with some 220 grit to make it nice and smooth. And then by hand, I hit the inside edge of those recessed panels just to knock it down and make it nice to the touch. And just like that, our drawer faces are complete and ready to be installed onto, well, our drawers, dummy. Let's start with installing the overmount drawer faces first. Now I created these drawer faces with a half inch overhang. So the first thing I do is mark a half inch down and a half inch over onto my actual face frame. So I know exactly where that drawer face needs to land. 
Now, if you're going to install overmount drawer faces with any regularity at all, get yourself a pair of these drawer face clamps from Rockler. They're amazing and they will save you so many headaches. They work just like this. There's a right side clamp you hook on, well, the right side, and there's a left side clamp you hook on, gosh, do I have to explain it to you? The left side. And then you insert your drawer face just like this, position it where you want it to be positioned with that half inch overhang, and then you just tighten it down. These clamps hold your drawer face firmly in place and then allow you to pull it out and screw it in from the drawer box. But I understand that not everybody has these clamps or doesn't want to spend the money on these clamps to do just a few drawer faces, so here's a couple other ways you can do it. If your face frame allows, you can clamp a piece of temporary wood onto the face of your cabinet. As you can see, I am clamping it a half inch down because we have a half inch overhang. Then you simply just set your drawer face onto that piece of wood and screw it in place from inside your drawer. If that doesn't work, you could also map out exactly where your hardware is going to be placed on your drawer face. Then drilling through your drawer face into your drawer box, you can simply attach your hardware on and that will hold your drawer face in place until you can secure it with screws from the inside. But tell you what, I have these special clamps, so why the heck would I not use them? So that's what I'm going to use to install my drawer faces. I like to install the drawer faces using these one inch cabinet screws from GRK. I like that they have this big fatty head on them, which keeps me from accidentally sinking the screw too far through the drawer box and poking it out the front. Nobody wants to do that. If you are interested in these drawer face clamps, I will include a link to them in the video description below. But with our drawer faces clamped securely, I simply open up the drawer and sink two screws from inside the cabinet. Now eventually these will get four screws, however I like to do two screws at the top to start with. Then after I get everything put together, painted, and I know I'm not going to have to adjust anything, I'll sink the other two screws. It's much easier to sink two new screws from the bottom if I have to adjust and then resync the screws on the top if there aren't already four holes in the cabinet that the screws are going to want to try and find. And once I get the top one done, I do the bottom one and booyah! Both of our overmount drawer faces are installed quick and easy. Now let's do the inset drawer faces. Now I've cut my drawer faces to be an eighth inch shy of the actual size of my opening. This will allow for a sixteenth of an inch space around the entire drawer face once I get it installed. Now the easiest way to do this is just with a deck of cards. You just count out even amount of cards to go on both sides as well as the top and the bottom making sure that you shove enough cards in there that it is nice and snug. You really want it wedged in place. Then once you get all your cards inserted and you have a nice even reveal around the entire thing, you simply reach inside the cabinet box, add some screws, and voila! Remove your cards. Now you can see that my gap on the top is just a little bit bigger than my gap on the bottom. But hey, remember those fancy undermount drawer slides we used? Yeah this is where they come in real handy because we can simply open the drawer and using our auto adjust mechanisms built into the drawer slides we adjust it up a little bit and look at that a perfect reveal around the entire perimeter of our inset drawer if at this point you're thinking what the heck I don't remember any drawer slides well, it's because you didn't watch part two of the cabinet building series, so why don't you quit whining and go back and watch part two? Then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about with those fancy drawer slides. Anyways, after doing the top, we do the exact same thing to the bottom. The only difference is that to get to the bottom drawer, we have to first remove the top drawer, which is also quick and easy because of those fancy drawer slides we used. With the top drawer removed, we can reach inside the cabinet, install a few screws, reinsert the top drawer, and voila, 
our bottom drawer is installed. This one just happens to be perfect right off the bat. No adjustments needed. That doesn't usually happen, but <laughs> I'm really glad it happened on camera for you guys. As you can see, I'm going to adjust those auto adjusters all the way over so you can see how well they work. See the big gap on the right and no gap on the left? But we can move the drawer after it's installed because of those fancy drawer slides and reposition it any way we want. This will make inset drawers so much easier for you guys. So if you didn't watch video two, go back and watch that about installing drawer slides and how easy undermount drawer slides are to actually install. And our cabinet is done and ready for paint. If you were doing a cabinet with cabinet doors, they are built exactly the same way as the drawer faces except for that quarter inch panel and of course you hook them on with hinges. I'll have to do another video at some point showing cabinet door installation because it can get a little tricky, but alas, that will have to be for another time.